Hello and welcome to Film Slam Screen's post-film conversation for Unexpected. My name is Eric Seiler and I'm an instructor of film, media arts, and communications, as well as moderator for this conversation. We are very pleased to be joined by the director of Unexpected, Zebaniah Newman. Zebaniah is joining us today from Los Angeles, California. Hello, Zebaniah, and welcome. Thank you so much, Eric. And you can call me Zeb. Zeb, okay, that is fine. That is just fine. Um, one thing, Zeb, about this film, I, it, when um, it was mentioned in the film that um, HIV and AIDS was really came to the surface 40 years ago, I can't believe it's been 40 years and um, and you brought us some good points in the film. Can you tell us um, how you got to connect with the subjects and actually make this film? Yeah, so before, thank you very much for having me first. Before I made this film, my first film was a film called Right to Try, which was about um, sort of a look at the business of HIV and how one pharmaceutical company, Gilead, basically controls the entire market. They control all of the patents, all of the treatments, and that they're also the company that's tasked with curing HIV. So we sort of explore the, the conflict of interest there. But while I was making that film, I kept coming up against um, information about how uh, explosive HIV is in the South, specifically with like heterosexual black women and in the black communities period in the south and as i kept hearing those numbers and those like stories those drips of stories i um you know being a storyteller i i had to like do a little bit of um research and i started poking around and started contacting organizations and i um it took about six months of really uh, trying to befriend like the sister love people and the Well Project um, and earn their sort of trust. And eventually I was introduced to Masonia and Cece, the two women that we feature in the film. And from the very first time I met them, it was clear to me that they were the perfect messengers for this story. They were the perfect subjects. They, you know, they're in their charm and they're like just their auras were so captivating that I knew that I had to um, tell their story. Well, wonderful, wonderful. You know, when when I um, prepare for the interview, I have like a set of questions, but I like the conversation to take um, shape for us to just talk back and forth. One thing you just mentioned was about heterosexual women um, and um, and contracted HIV. And um, can you tell us the reason why that is such a um, you know, such a, such a case. Emerging. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I don't think that there's ever one specific reason. I think we're looking at health disparities in the South. We're also looking at, um, there's this, a great stigma against homosexuality within the black community. There's also a stigma against HIV in the black community. And when you have a crumbling healthcare system and a lack of access to direct health care, um, as well as uh, a huge stigma against a uh, a group of people and a disease and a lifestyle, it creates this opportunity for disease to spread. And because disease is spreading in the rural parts of this country, I'm not talking about like Atlanta or Mobile or Tallahassee. I'm talking like 50, 75 miles outside of those city centers where people don't have, you know, major hospitals and infectious disease doctors and information that is being sort of you know, given to them in a way to help educate them so that they can make different choices or whatnot. That is why the disease is spreading. And also, you know, there's a huge um, gap in terms of the messaging from the pharmaceutical companies to Black people, to Black women specifically. I, I've spoken to dozens of Black women who um, they don't want to go to the Gay and Lesbian Center to get their HIV medication. They're not watching RuPaul's Drag Race. They're not watching the shows and reading the magazines that would be giving them information on how to treat this disease. So there's like a gap in the message, the marketing of the messaging from the HIV experts to the people who need it most. So it's just a bunch of these variables which has created this just, you know, crisis that's happening. Interesting, really interesting. One thing you didn't mention, do you feel that um, you can place some type of um, blame on 
the researchers of pharmaceutical companies because you know there is a lot of money in the treatment, but is there as much money in finding the cure? Yeah, that uh, that has always been the question. Um, you know, when one company is making billions and tens and tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars treating a disease, I I really question their motivation to cure it. You know, and so that really isn't the film. The film is about the power of a shared experience. The film is about these two women who have taken their own trauma and their own life circumstances and turned it into a powerful underground network of women helping women cope with and survive an HIV diagnosis in this country, in rural places. Um, it's really a look at the power of a shared experience, the power of a sisterhood, and just a look at these two heroes, you know? Like they, Masonia and Cece, take what they have which isn't much and they use it to the most effective powerful way possible you know and i i just um you know i wanted to be i wanted to paint like a beautiful profile in courage and a profile in community service i didn't really want to focus on the big questions of like pharmaceutical companies and all that other stuff on this film oh, okay absolutely understand but yeah other issues do come up. That's the power of film. You can just um, springboard and films have legs. But getting back to this film itself, um, the two women, very powerful. You gain the trust of them. Let's talk a little bit more about the production. How much time did you spend with them before you started actually filming? And how long did you film? The very first day I met them, I, I filmed with them. Hmm. Um, uh, there is footage, there's a scene where Cece is talking about a doctor told her that her babies would be orphans, um, her children would be orphaned. That was the very first day I met them. That scene where we just sat and chatted for two hours, we covered so much. Um, I um, I immediately knew, like, from the second I met them, that they were, like, they were the perfect people to focus on, but um, I filmed, I'm based in LA. I must have traveled to New York and Atlanta, the Atlanta area, maybe 10, 12 times over the course of like a year and a half, maybe two years. There was a lot of things we filmed, we explored that wound up not making it into the movie. There was a lot of um, uh, nonprofit sort of um, work that Masonia does. She speaks on a ton of panels. There was like national world, there was national black HIV awareness day. She spoke on a big panel. Like there was just a lot of stuff that we filmed that we wound up not using in, in the movie. But, um, you know, it was, as a filmmaker, I try not to have too much of a clear idea on what I want it to be. I just try to like, like scoop as much as I can. And then in the edit, start to piece together, oh, this really matches well with this. This this is a nice, you know, flow. Um, because I, I, you know, any filmmaker, or any creator will tell you that the magic really happens in the edit. And so I just wanted to have as much coverage as possible. So there was a lot that we filmed that we wound up not using, but um, any time hanging out with Masoni and CC was always fun and, um, you know, they're great. They are, they are too fun. They have great energy on the film festival circuit, the dinners, the parties, the red carpets, they've just been so much fun. Like I, I consider them friends. Oh, absolutely. Their, their personalities are extremely infectious. And um, I, I know what you mean. There's a, a couple, yeah, when, when you, that, that um, quote that you put on the screen about how, you know, the prepare for your children to be or, or, orphans, and no, the, when she said that, I, I had to actually replay that. I said, did she really just say what I thought she said? And just the, the, the powerful words that came out, and I imagine you left some powerful things out of the film. Can you tell us a couple of things that you may have left out of the film that you should be at time you would have included? Mm -hmm. Um, there's a real call to action around the idea that Medicaid expansion needs to happen in the South. There was a lot of talk about um, from the experts we where we sort of explored that. And we also showed um, a lot of, you know, the reality of what it's like to be poor and sick and in the rural parts of this country that we wound up not using. Um, I'm trying to think what else. 
there was CC's baby shower, which we wound up not using. Um, you know, there was just like lots of, um, I'm trying to think there, what were the big things we cut? The big thing was the Medicaid expansion. We really did like a deep dive on like the 13 states. I think it was 13 states that have not expanded Medicaid. We wound up cutting that whole section and just because it took us too far off topic, which was really Masonia and CC. And I didn't want to make a political film. I didn't want people to be turned off by the underlining of political um, opinions, you know? Exactly. Okay, that's good. Um, one quote I like in the film, one of the subjects said, when you um, service a woman, you service the community. Yeah. It's just so powerful. And they're right, because, um, you know, women are the backbones of a community. They give birth to children and so forth. So I, I'm just glad that you saved that towards the end to kind of like carry things home. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think another quote that I really enjoy is, is if you fix it for Black women, you fix it for everyone. And I just wanted to keep underlining this idea that um, we can do more, you know, as a society that we can do more and that, you know, there are real... Um, there were real lives at stake here, you know, and there's also a future generation, like to the kids that are watching this, right? Like at some point, these kids are going to be mayors and senators and, and doctors, and they're going to be running the community and they're going to be in positions of power. And it is important to plant this seed of taking care of people at a young age, you know? And so I felt like for me, it was more important to sort of underline this idea that these people deserve the same amount of um, medical attention and access to care as everyone else does. Exactly. And like you said, people watching this, you know, will be in positions of power. And I like the way one of the ending quotes was about, you know, if, um, you know, if we can't have a seat at the table, at least, at least let us be on the menu. Yeah, that was almost the title of the film on the menu. <laughs> that was almost the title of the film. Um, yeah, you know, that is a very powerful statement because she's right, right? Like not everyone gets to be at the table having the discussions over like what is going to go down, but whoever is at that table should at least have some awareness that they are speaking for groups of people who can't be there, you know, and that there should be some type of, um, I don't know, not pressure, but um, responsibility, placed on people who get to sit at the table and make decisions that are going to affect millions of people. Absolutely. But you just said you changed the title of the film. Why did you entitle it Unexpected? Um, because it was a play on this idea that in, in this country, when you're pregnant, when you finally find out you're pregnant, that is usually the first time you're at, you have to get an HIV test. So you have thousands of women in the South who find out they're pregnant and then they're at the doctor and the doctor is like, all right, we're going to do an HIV test. And so it's, you know, a play on this expecting, you know, it's unexpected to, to find out you're pregnant and HIV positive in the same week, which is really what a lot of these women are having, which to me feels like the most unbelievable roller coaster possible. And to most of these women, they don't know HIV. And when they look up HIV, they see these horrific images from the 80s and 90s of like gay white men dying in very horrific, horrific ways. So it's like a very... Um, it must just be a very confusing and scary time. So unexpected was sort of like, and I also liked, I wanted to keep it short. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, great. So <clears throat> you, you mentioned about the um, film circuit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the response to the film, especially when you had yeah, this? The, <clears throat> the film has won some awards. It's played at uh, like over like 15 film festivals. It's um, Oscar qualified. We're in the early stages of an Oscar campaign for best documentary short. Um, it's, uh, it's been some of the highlights were playing at the Essence Fest in July. The me and Masoni and CC and Cheryl Lee Ralph were all there. Um, it was, I think, on record, one of the hottest weekends in the history of New Orleans. I mean, it was like, it felt like we were dying. It was so hot there that weekend, but um, it was one of the most fun experiences at a film festival I've ever had. Um, the other thing is, is that going to these film festivals, you get to see a bunch of other films. And I was personally at the Essence Film Festival, the amount of African filmmakers that were present with projects 
I found I was super impressed and and surprised by the level of uh, talent and storytelling that was coming out of Africa, especially in the horror department. They there was they have a whole series of horror films that play at the Essence Film Festival, and just like you know, one of the benefits. Sorry, what I was saying was one of the benefits of going to a film festival is you get to meet all these other people and you get to see their films and interact with them. And I would encourage students or people who are watching this if you have any interest in filmmaking whether it's documentary or narrative or whatever go to a film festival like just see what's happening there right and like go check out the films that you've never heard of before go see a block of shorts they usually play like five or six shorts in one block it's a really good way to sort of expand your creative thoughts and connect with like you know young and emerging filmmakers uh, absolutely um yeah the the power of film, you know, just not even my, not just making it, but watching it as well. They're participating, yeah. And participating as well too. So good luck with the um, um, with the Oscars. I'm I'm sure. Hopefully, it will be right there towards towards the end. And do you have any upcoming festivals on um, that? This will be um, where we just played at Savannah this past weekend. I just got home. We played Saturday at Savannah, the SCAD Film Festival, which was incredible. Right now, we are like this close to locking a, a distribution deal where it's going to be available on a very popular streamer that everyone's heard of, hopefully by World AIDS Day, which is December 1st. Um, fingers crossed for that. And if it lands on the streamer, then we won't really do many more film festivals because obviously if you can turn on the TV and watch it, that's like the ideal situation. But um, yeah. Well, great, great. So what's next for you? Are you working on another project right now? I do. I have another film out right now called Relighting Candles. It's about a candle maker in West Hollywood who he's 85 and every... Christmas season, he hires homeless and newly sober people to pour the Christmas candles. There's about 5,000 Christmas candles that are ordered and they literally fill his shop and they pour the candles, they package them. And it's a very transient, intense work environment where you have people who are literally trying to save their lives and turn their lives around working at in the holidays. So it's a Christmas film. It's a look at the Christmas spirit. And it's also a look at the homeless and fentanyl crisis that's happening in los angeles right now it's um it turned out so good i'm so proud of it it's like a very sweet intersectional story and melissa mccarthy and her husband ben falcone are our producing partners on it and um it's been a joy getting to work on that wonderful i i, I can't wait to see it hope hopefully it'll make the festival circuit yeah. as well and come to cleveland as well too I hope so. Well, this has been really great. Um, before I close, any um, interest in making uh, Unexpected into a feature? I am not looking to make Unexpected into a feature, but I am talking with Cheryl Lee Ralph about doing a feature on um, a very specific time in her life that is, you know, she was in the show Dream Girls, the original Dream Girls cast in 1981. Um, which premiered in December 1981 at the Imperial Theater in New York. And by 1985, a third of the cast and crew had all died of AIDS. And um, it's a, it's another intersectional story look at like Broadway, HIV in the Black community, and the power of legacy. So we're talking about that as a potential feature, but very early stages, very, very early stages. That sounds interesting, really yeah. interesting. Well, Zeb Newman, thank you so much. Director thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate your time. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabrielle. Okay, and thank you to our viewers for joining us for this important and invigorating conversation. For more information about our upcoming film festivals, please visit us at clevelandfilm.org. I'm Eric Seiler. Thank you. Bye, guys.